All right, Joe, welcome back to Lectures on Lacan. We are starting here with Seminar 14, The Logic of Fantasy. Um, it's a wild leap that we're making. So the previous two lectures that we did, one was on Seminar 11. We had a four or five part series on 11. And then we, from the end of 11, built a little two part series on the drive. Um, the drive is available. It's out there. You can find it through our Substack, lecturesonlacan.substack.com. Uh, seminar 11 is out there too. So you can go to these materials. We're going to be building on some of what we did in those uh, seminars. And, 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 I'm going to, and I'm going to try and review some of it that's relevant here as well. Um, but if you hear me refer to stuff from those previous um, series, particularly on the drive, which is where we were uh, just a few weeks ago, um, rest assured that you can find those lectures. Um, the lectures on the drive are freely available at our Substack and um, have at them. Um, the other thing to, to note here is that we're skipping some seminars. I was thinking that maybe we would just jump right into uh, seminar 12 and then just keep going from there. But after some thought, I figured we better just jump to 14, which will then set us up, I think, um, for perhaps. Um, a stop at 16 and 17, or perhaps jumping straight to 19 and 20. At this point, given where we are, we've read the first 60 or 70 pages of seminar 14. It's really looking like the jump from here is to 19 and to 20, uh, but we'll see. I haven't read this seminar. I'm eager to see where it goes. And so I'll be working through it with you. And that's what we're going to be doing here is working through key passages and really just trying to iron out what Lacan is doing in the opening sections of this seminar, which is very heavy with logic, um, maybe more than it needs to be because at some level, he's really just talking about some pretty simple um, set theoretical phenomena. But let's start uh, getting into it as best we can um, and try to provide ourselves with a solid conceptual um, basis to discuss what this seminar is about. So first and foremost, let's start with some basic Lacanian stuff. Um, as we all know, and oftentimes all too well, lack is a core concept in Lacanian theory and technique. And it's such a core concept, it's very key. I mean, frankly, I'm sick of talking about it, but it is a very key concept in Lacan, and especially because in the English tradition, there's been such a heavy emphasis on what Lacan does with desire. And that's really what we learned in our last series on the drive, among other things, is that all of this emphasis on desire doesn't actually do justice to Lacan's decision in seminar 11, which I take to be one of the great seminars, um, to choose drive instead of desire as the fourth fundamental concept of psychoanalysis. So anytime you hear people yammering on about desire and lack and the split subject, which is all good and important stuff, um, think to yourself and perhaps even pose the question, if all this is extremely relevant to Lacanian theory and technique, why does he choose drive in his basic introductory seminar to his work as the fourth fundamental concept? Now, lack is also relevant to drive. Um, I would say we could probably split it a little bit and say that you have lack relevant to desire um, and probably um, loss relative to drive, but we don't need to get into that right now. What we know first and foremost is that lack is fundamental. And what I would suggest emphasizing the word logic here, more than fantasy at this stage in the seminar, logic, the logic of lack in Lacan is structural. That comes through very clearly at the start of 14. The logic of lack in Lacan's thought is structural. And I would say that the structural lack at the center of Lacan's thought is threefold. And maybe if we push it fourfold, here are the three great moments in my reading. First, sexuation. This is sexuation with regard to the living organism. These are the straits of sexuality that Lacan discusses um, in his early to mid 60s work. So think about seminar 11 and dip back into our series on the drive if you want to learn more about that. 
Sexuation is the first great experience of lack because what is removed or subtracted or placed under erasure in the experience of passing through the bipolarities of sex is this polymorphous, almost perverse relationship to the body that in hindsight we call libido. This is all over 11. Um, we might even check out a couple passages today. The second great um, structural lack in Lacan coordinates with this concept of alienation. If sexuation is an experience of lack that the living organism undergoes, alienation is an experience of lack that happens with regard to the subject, the living subject as Lacan sometimes calls what comes after this living organism, um, a split subject. Alienation is the process sometimes referred to as castration that gives us split subjectivity. The focus here in alienation is on the lack experienced by the self or the subject. The third great structural lack in Lacan coordinates with this notion of separation. Alienation and separation, these are two terms that are popping big in seminar 11. Um, separation has to do more with the lack in the big other, with the fact that the big other is barred, that there's always something missing from its claim to totalize. And, and that's how this breaks down. Sexuation with regard to the living organism, alienation with regards to the subject, and separation with regards to the other. In each case, you see a structural lack popping up. Um, you, yeah, the first is a real lack. Sexuation is produced atop what Lacan calls a real lack. And alienation and separation um, are, are mired in kind of imaginary and symbolic lacks. Um, the fourth lack, uh, we'll see if we get to it. Um, it's, it's what comes after separation. It's beyond um, the symbolic and the drive that it cultivates. Let's just slow down though for a second. This first um, lack around sexuation, it figured largely in our concluding lectures on seminar 11. Um, and of course, in our recent series on the drive, if you're looking for a quick summary of what this is about, you can check out page 205 of seminar 11, and it might just be worth us reading it aloud here because I know there are some of you um, here with us this morning in California time, um, evening European time, so forth, um, who weren't with us for 11 and who weren't with us for the drive. So let me just rehearse this passage with you very quickly on page 205. Actually, 204 and 205 are pretty lit pages for understanding uh, the first couple of lacks I was just describing. At the top of 205, if you have Seminar 11 in front of you, it's an easy text to find online. I'm looking here at, of course, the Alan Sheridan translation at the top of page 205. Lacan talks about a real earlier lack prior to that of alienation which is situated at the advent of the living being, that is to say, as sexed reproduction. I'm about seven lines down from the top of page 205, if you're catching up here. The real lack is what the living being loses, that part of himself qua living being in reproducing himself through the way of sex. This lack is real because it relates to something real, namely the living being. By being subject to sex, it has fallen under the blow of individual death. Now, we spent a lot of time working on this in our previous series, so I'm not going to mess around too much with it, except to just remind you that part of what happens at the level of the species is that in order for the species to live on, the individuals of which it is comprised at any given moment must die. So, as soon as sexed reproduction, becomes uh, the structure in which the living organism is put. Um, and, and what Lacan is, it could, could very well be referring to here, I think there's ample evidence in seminar 11 to support, is a theory of positionality and a theory of um, gendered subject positions. 
He's talking about the way that society genders us and beneath that sexualizes us by forcing us into these binary categories. And the straits of sexuality for Lacan are binary. So he's talking about how this is a socially constructed experience that the living organism, the infant, the worm that comes out early and has to pass through. And in passing through it experiences their first ex um, lack or their first loss, um, a loss that can be recovered as we learned um, by way of the drive. Uh, but for here, the emphasis on death is important because what we see in the symbolic is also an experience of death because the signifier can make present things that are absent. The signifier in this sense um, allows for the death of the thing, not das Ding, but the death of stuff. Here though, we're seeing a different relation to death with the idea of just raw mortality. The fact that every individual member of a species dies, um, even though the species may live on. Whether that becomes true for, for our species, we'll see in the next probably couple hundred years. Anyway, you can read more about this um, sexuation and this real lack. Uh, 205 is great. There are other pages. And again, um, see our earlier stuff on this. What I want to emphasize here, though, is on 204 or 205 of Seminar 11, you also see this notion of real lack coupled with another lack. And this is the lack that points us to alienation. This is a really great section of Lacan where he just spells some of this stuff out. So if you back up from the top of 205 and go to the bottom of 204, Lacan starts at the very bottom of 204 of Seminar 11 saying that two lacks overlap here. The first emerges from the central defect around which the dialectic of the advent of the subject to his own being in relation to the other turns. This is what I just referred to as alienation. So we just read about the primordial experience of lack that, that I referred to as sexuation. And now we're looking at what follows this earlier experience of lack, um, which is alienation. And it has to do with the defect around which the dialectic of the advent of the subject to his own being in relation to the other turns. So alienation has to do with the advent of the subject in and through the symbolic, the big other. In other words, Lacan says at the top of 205, by the fact that the subject depends on the signifier and that the signifier is first of all in the field of the other. This is a great little summary of what alienation means in terms of these structural lacks that are at the core of Lacan's thought, or at least the, the second one in my book known as Alienation. <clears throat> There's more on this too, in fact, really good stuff in 11. And I'm emphasizing this because it's fundamental to understanding what's happening in 14. I don't think you can understand what Lacan is doing in 14 unless you are trained in post-Cantorian set theory or a terrific reader of Badiou. If you want to figure out like where you're going to start with Badiou, he'll often tell you start with, with 19. But um, I think if you push Badiou a little bit on this, his, his real starting place for his entire project would probably start in 14. In fact, for, for Badiou, you can ask him, he'll, he'll tell you that there are, there are two really difficult ideas for him in Lacan. Um, the first is love, and the second is Lacan's notion of the one. And it's really in, in 14 that the one, if you see us on Instagram, you know I've been posting about this recently. And, and if you subscribe to our Substack, it's also popping there a little bit. The one is a really fundamental concept for Lacan, especially in his later work. That's what we're going to try and get hashed out today and probably next week as well. Um, so if you got Badu under your belt, it'll be easy to understand what we're doing here. If you're a mathematician and you've read Cantor, it'll also be easy to understand what Lacan's up to here. Um, if you're a symbolic logician, good luck. I don't know what you'd be doing here, but you might be able to find uh, this easy as well. For the rest of us, start with 11. It's seminar 11 that's going to pave the way for understanding what Lacan is doing in 14. That's why we're here. That's why I'm starting us by taking 
a giant step back. We take this giant step back in order to start taking some preliminary and tentative steps forward into 14. So in that spirit, let's stick with this and back up even further. Page 203 of Seminar 11 also gives us a nice rundown of this notion of alienation. <clears throat> and I'm here maybe uh, five, six, seven, eight lines from the bottom. The sentence begins, the other. And I'll read it aloud. So if you don't have the text in front of you, you can still just um, close your eyes, think you're somewhere else, and imagine... <laughs> <laughs> Listen, okay, anyway. The other is the locus in which is situated the chain of the signifier that governs whatever may be made present of the subject. It is the field of that living being in which the subject has to appear. Now, this is important. The other, and here think the symbolic, the field of language, the field of social norms, conventions, and so forth is the locus or the location or the site in which is situated the chain of the signifier, think language again, that governs whatever may be made present of the subject. Whatever can be made present of the subject is gonna occur by way of the signifier. And the signifier is governed by the rules of the symbolic of society, of the big other. So whatever can show up and appear by way of the subject as a representation, as a metaphor, as a figure, figure is a good way to think about it, all figurations of the split subject that appear and that are addressed are occurring according to the structural logics of language, of signification, which are governed in this field known as the symbolic, the big other, these terms all cluster together around this field, a phenomenological field, where the subject can appear, but only if it plays by the rules and only to the extent that the rules exist for it at the level of the symbolic. So we're starting on 203 and just starting to get a little forward here on this topic. We can jump past 204 and 205 and start instead with page 206, I think is a pretty good one to start here. Um, I'm tempted to just jump right to the pen tab and start diagramming this stuff, but I think it's nicer to actually hear some of this read. 206 to 208 does a really good job of talking about this second structural lack in the field of alienation that we were just talking about. And it comes down to this, section two, which begins on page 206 of 11. Everything emerges from the structure of the signifier. This structure is based on what I first called the function of the cut, and which is now articulated in the development of my discourse as the topological function of the rim. And this is gonna be very important. In fact, there's a very real sense in which what is at stake in the later part of our readings in 14 is this rim-like structure, which for Lacan comes down to the mathematical notion of the edge. So hold this in mind. The relation of the subject to the other is entirely produced in a process of gap. Without this, anything could be there. The relations between beings in the real including all of you animated beings out there, might be produced in terms of inversely reciprocal relation. This is what psychology and the whole area of sociology is trying to do and may succeed in doing as far as the mere animal kingdom is concerned. For the capture of the imaginary is enough to motivate all sorts of behavior in the living being. Psychoanalysis reminds us that human psychology belongs to another dimension. To maintain this dimension, philosophical analysis might have sufficed, but it has proved itself to be inadequate for lack of any adequate definition of the unconscious. You see, philosophy had to come first with its high priority on consciousness in order for us to get psychoanalysis. 
Philosophy is the precondition for psychoanalysis, disciplinarily speaking. Lacan's clear on this also at the start of seminar 14. No Descartes, no Freud. No emphasis on the cogito, no emphasis on the unconscious. Philosophy precedes psychoanalysis. But what philosophy lacks is a theory of the unconscious. Psychoanalysis then reminds us that the facts of human psychology cannot be conceived in the absence of, hear me now, the function of the subject defined as the effect of the signifier. Notice how quickly Lacan moves from framing the unconscious as the missing element of philosophy to this notion of a subject defined as an effect of the signifier. Here the processes are to be articulated, of course, as circular between the subject and the other. This is important. From the subject called to the other, to the subject of that which he has himself seen appear in the field of the other, from the other coming back. This process is circular, but of its nature without reciprocity. Because it is circular, it is disymmetrical. This is going to become the structural logic that gets Lacan into these early thoughts on alienation and separation. This circular but non-reciprocal relationship that the subject has with the other and vice versa. So hold that in mind. Hold in mind this circular relation that he's getting at here. It's not usually a passage here on 207 and seminar 11 that everybody highlights and focuses on the circularity without reciprocity that is happening in the relationship between the subject and the other. But it's incredibly important to understanding what Lacan's doing here. And remember, right out of the gates in seminar 14, it's all about structural logic. And that's what I'm pushing on here. I'm pushing us back to this stage in which the structural logics of alienation and separation start showing up. You'll realize I'm reading from Lacan here, that today I am taking you on a terrain of a, on the terrain of a logic whose essential importance I hope to stress. The whole ambiguity of the sign derives from the fact that it represents something for someone. Um, you could mess you can mess around with this a lot. Uh, Miller has done some pretty good work on this. I mean, you can trace it back to Charles Sanders' purse and this notion of the sign, which is something that Lacan is messing with. You might even say that Lacan's theory of his his linguistic theory is um, founded on three uh, pillars. Uh, one of them being purse and purse's theory of of the sign. Um, the other, of course, being Saussure. But but purse doesn't get enough uh, get get enough attention here. Um, Miller, to his great credit, ha has been somebody who has drawn this out. Um, uh, so Lacan is, is drawing on American traditions of semiotics. Um, uh, he's also looking at, of course, French traditions with Saussure. Everybody talks till they're blue in the face about Lacan's relationship to Saussure. Um, leave it to the American to say, don't forget about Charles Sanders' purse. This someone may be many things. It may be the entire universe. Um, do you know the etymology of the word universe? It's, it's really worth noting here. Um, unus is the Latin for one. And verse, you might think it has to do with language or something like that. It doesn't. It doesn't. It has to do with turning. Universe always means universalization or onenetization. It is the transformation a turning or a transforming of multiples into singulars. That's really important here. Universe, when Lacan says it, and I, I don't have evidence of this, but, but I believe he's so tuned into language that it wouldn't be a stretch to say that when he uses the word universe, he has, very much has in mind the etymological uh, understanding, the Latin understanding of um, of, of universe, which is to make some things appear as one, to unite, if you will. And as much as we have known for some time that information circulates in it as a negative of entropy, 
Another good word that not enough people have focused on in, in this work is the notion of entropy. Um, a good, another good way to put props though to, to Miller though, because he I think he gets what Lacan's up to here with, with entropy. Any nod in which signs are concentrated, any node in which signs are concentrated, insofar as they represent something, may be taking, taken for a someone. What must be stressed at the outset is that a signifier is that which represents the subject for another signifier. <clears throat> Here is Lacan's very important move, is to say that a signifier is that which represents a subject for another signifier. The split subject can only be figured in the field of language, in the field of signification. And signifiers are always addressed. Lacan's point, though, is to shift from this notion of signifiers addressed to some ones, to people, to signifiers addressed to other signifiers. And what he's trying to remind us of there is that language, the field of signification, is a differential system. All these signifiers have differential relations to each other. They're all linked up. <clears throat> You'll oftentimes hear me referring to the experience of looking up words in the dictionary. So you can pick your word, take the word snake, look it up in the dictionary, and you'll find a host of other words that do not equal snake, but without which you can't understand snake. And some of those words you might not recognize, turning you to other words in that dictionary, looking those up. Snake, long, narrow, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what's long mean? What's narrow mean? These send you elsewhere in the dictionary. And pretty soon you have this network of differential relations. Differential because snake doesn't equal long. It has the attribute of long. And long doesn't equal the opposite of short. These are all differential relations. So signifier to signifier is a differential relation for Lacan. The subject can only show up phenomenologically in the form of a signifier. All signifiers are addressed, but they are not addressed to others. They are addressed to other signifiers. Incredibly important line in Lacan popping right here on page 207 it will be relevant to what we're doing in 14. The famous bumper sticker in 14 is the signifier cannot represent itself. It cannot signify itself. That's where he starts with 14. Note the connection here between the differential relations that all signifiers have to each other and Lacan's claim that the signifier cannot signify itself. And here, of course, what he's saying the signifier signifies, which is always a subject. Maybe. The signifier producing itself in the field of the other makes manifest the subject of its signification, but it functions as a signifier only to reduce the subject in question to being no more than a signifier, to petrify the subject in the same movement in which it calls the subject to function, to speak, as subject. So what happens when you figure the subject in a signifier is you petrify it, you freeze it for a moment. Now, if you've got ears to hear, what we're talking about here is the relationship between the ego and the unconscious. There, strictly speaking, is the temporal pulsation in which is established that which is the characteristic of the departure of the unconscious as such, the closing. Now, I'm not going to get into this. We don't have time for it today. But remember what we were doing in our previous series on 11 and the drive. The unconscious has a certain structure. Yes, it's linguistic, not relevant here. The important part about the unconscious is it has a temporal structure, not just a spatialized structure. The logic of the unconscious, I would wager even more fundamentally, is temporal. And its logic, its temporal logic, is a pulsative logic. The unconscious is a, can be seen in openings that also close. Something opens up in discourse, and the unconscious is able to sleep, slip through. But that same thing can close. 
This is what transference means. It's the closure of an opening that could otherwise be opened to reveal the unconscious, to allow the unconscious to express itself. The point, though, here Lacan is really trying to get at is this notion of the subject that is going to fade, disappear, become petrified, and fall in behind um, the signifier that represents it. Wanealis felt this at another level and tried to signify it in term in a term that was new and which has never been exploited since in the field of analysis, um, aphinesis, disappearance. This came up uh, in, in this comes up in almost all of our um, seminars. This is a great little passage to get after it. Um, check out Ernest Jones, he says, who invented it, mistook it for something rather absurd, the fear of seeing desire disappear. Now, aphinesis is to be situated in a more radical way at the level at which the subject manifests himself in this movement of disappearance. Here is the, here is the, 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 the idea to wrap your head around with the subject. The subject only shows up in the field of the symbolic as a disappearance, as a disappearing. It fades. That's how it shows up. Um, this wouldn't be the comet that you see streaking across the sky. It would be the tail of it. It's not the jet that you see moving across the sky, but the dissipating exhaust as it goes through. Um, for those of you that read the work of Walter Benjamin, um, this is, you can wrap your head around this very quickly. Um, there's an erratic element um, to the subject. And for Lacan, um, the subject which manifests itself only in the movement of disappearance is fucking lethal. This movement of disappearance that I have described as lethal, in a quite different way, I have called this movement the fading of the subject. Now, we can keep going with this. We don't need to. We can scroll down to 209. And Lacan continues with, make no mistake, this is a logic that he's working through here. And once we arrive at the diagram on page 211, this famous diagram with two joining circles, this veil of alienation, you'll see why it matters. This diagram that everybody pops with all the time, what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up to discuss it, to look at it, to look at this second field of structural lack known as alienation, which is going to be fundamental to understanding what Lacan is doing with fantasy. Not surprisingly, on 209, fantasy comes up. You can see it starting to appear in section three. The mathing for fantasy is there. Then comes that of drive, all in order to show you on 209 the figure of the lozenge. But Lacan is only showing you that because he wants the bottom half, this V in the lower half that marks a veil constituted by the first operation where I wish to leave you for a moment. Veil, don't worry about it. It means either or. It's an either or that he's getting after here. Here, the either or is going to be between the subject at the level of being and the other at the level of meaning the other meaning in the field of signification, the symbolic, the differential world of signifiers, so on and so forth. You know I'm moving fast here. You can feel I'm moving fast. I'm doing this for a reason. I don't want to spend a bunch of time in the past. I want to get us to the future for us, which is 14. But it is important in all things analytic um, to remember where you've been. Otherwise, you'll get lost on your way. Indeed, you may find these things are all rather silly. Lacan continues at the bottom of 209. And I want to emphasize this. Listening to this lecture, you may indeed find that all of this shit is rather silly. And I want to emphasize that. There are high-end scholars on this call who might not yet see the relevance of this. There are high-end clinicians on this call who might not yet see the practical import of this. What we're after today and in 11, you may find as all rather silly. But hang tight. Let's see if we can flip that around. But logic is always a bit silly. 
in order to get us ready for 14, anytime you're reading these first few sections of seminar 14, if you start getting a little, I don't know, weirded out, return back to this passage. Logic is always a little bit silly. If one does not go to the root of the childish, one is inevitably precipitated into stupidity, as can be shown by innumerable examples, such as the supposed antinomies of reason. For example, the catalog of all the catalogs that do not include themselves. This is Russell's paradox. It's a paradox in set theory, and it's one that comes up numerous times at the start of seminar 14. The catalog of all catalogs that do not include themselves. Now it takes you a second to kind of wrap your head around that, but for Russell, it's a paradox because you have to wonder, is the catalog of all catalogs that do not contain themselves included in its own collection? Because if it is, then it has to be excluded because now it contains itself. This may all seem a little bit silly to you. I think what's really rad about this is when you get into seminar 14, Lacan just comes out multiple times and says, Russell's paradox isn't a paradox at all. There's nothing paradoxical about this. In the field of the unconscious, there's no such thing as a paradox. Contradiction doesn't exist. For now, though, he's introducing us to Russell's paradox, which is going to become the fundamental philosophical moment that Lacan refers to in the first part of Seminar 14. It's not Descartes. It's going to be Russell's paradox. This catalog of all the catalogs that do not include themselves. Now, at this point, you might want to pause and just go to Wikipedia and look up Russell's paradox and see all the beautiful symbols that come along with this stuff. Set theory is so much fun. And one arrives at an impasse, which I can't think why gives logicians vertigo. Notice this emphasis here. Lacan legit like doesn't understand why logicians are all freaked out about this stuff. But the answer is very obvious. Logicians emerging from the discipline of philosophy are freaked out by Russell's paradox because they do not have a conception of the unconscious. Yet the solution is very simple. It is that the signifier with which one designates the same signifier is evidently not the same signifier as the one with which one designates the other. This is obvious enough. I fucking love this stuff. Isn't this fabulous? The word obsolete, insofar as it may signify that the word obsolete is itself an obsolete word, is not the same word obsolete in each case. This ought to encourage us to develop this veil, this either or, that I have introduced to you. The subject is grounded in the either or of the first essential operation. To be sure, it is not all without interest to develop it here before so vast an audience, since it is a question of nothing less than the operation that we call alienation. Scroll down a couple paragraphs. Alienation consists in this veil, this either or, which if you do not object to the word condemned, I will use it, condemns the subject to appearing only in that division, which it seems to me I have just articulated sufficiently by saying, if it appears on one side as meaning produced by the signifier, it appears on the other as aphinesis, as fading, as disappearance. So as you move forward here, symbolic logic comes up again. The theory here is joining. And that is the structural logic of the Eulerian circles that you see on page 211 of seminar 11. That logic here is one of joining. It's about what is mutually exclusive in both of those circles. Not the little sliver in the middle, this field of non-meaning, but it's about what is contained in the field of meaning that is not in the field of being and what is in the field of being that is not in the field of meaning. That's what he's doing here with joining. Don't get confused here. It's about what's mutually exclusive in both sets, not what they share. 
That's why the emphasis here is on an either or. You can be in the field of meaning and appear before others. Or you can be in the field of being, but then you lose connection to appearance. We'll mess with this in a second. For now, let's just unfold it a little bit. The field of being, the left side of this circle, is the field of the enunciating subject. For those of you that have seen or listened to our podcast on the subversion of the subject, this is the embodied speaker. It's also going to be the field of truth for Lacan. It's where you don't think you're thinking. And it's where you exist as a result as the unconscious. On the other side, on the field of meaning, here's the field of the big other. This is not the enunciating subject. This is the space of the grammatical subject. The I that appears in language when I, as an enunciating speaker, say, I'm the kind of person that loves snakes. That's the grammatical subject. There's the enunciating subject that felt compelled to tell you that. And then there's the grammatical subject, which is the sense of self that is figured in language when I say the sentence, I'm the kind of person who loves snakes. And I'm using my fingers to indicate that what's happening here is a happening in the field of language. And there's a split here, a split between how I'm asking you to see me when I talk to you about my purported love of snakes. And the part of me that feels compelled to be seen as someone who loves snakes. Why, in this moment and addressed to you, am I so intent on being seen as somebody who likes snakes? That question of why, not what, why I would say such a thing, puts you on the, field, on the path to truth, the truth of the subject. The question of what, in other words, what do I want from you and what do I want you to see me as in this field of wanting recognition from others is something different. It doesn't put you on the path of truth. It puts you in the field of knowledge. What do I want you to know about me is an easy way to think about this. But for Lacan, truth and knowledge are not species of the same kind. If the field of being is where you don't think you're thinking. The field of meaning is where you think you are thinking. If the field of being is that of unconscious truth, the field of meaning is typically that of ego resistance. It's where you think you're thinking at the level of the ego, at the level of consciousness, self-consciousness. Cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, that's occurring in the field of meaning. Lacan's point is, wherever you think you're thinking, rest assured, you do not exist. It's where you don't think you're thinking that in fact you have your most profound thoughts and it's there that you find the being of yourself. Or because we're always operating within the field of the symbolic, this is like another turn of the screw, it's actually a field of non-being. In order to have this conversation about the place where I don't think I'm thinking, namely the unconscious, it can't be a place that supports my being because that isn't going to work. It's going to be a space that figures me always in a state of non-being. That's a little more philosophical than we need to get, but it's important here because it's a running theme throughout Lacan. Where you think you're thinking, I guarantee you're not. It's where you don't think you're thinking that all your great thoughts are happening. If you think you're thinking, rest assured you are not. And you can hear that in multiple ways. This veil, this um, process of alienation, um, you get a couple other really good examples of this. Um, 
in place of being and meaning, you get that famous um, uh, uh, paradox of your money or your life. So you're in an alleyway and somebody rolls up with a gun and says, your money or your life. And you get to choose. But here's the dilemma. If you choose to keep your money, you're still going to get shot losing your life. And the first thing the crook's going to do is pick your pocket and take your money. If you choose to keep your money, you're going to lose both your money and your life. If, however, you choose life over money and you get out your money and you give it to the crook, guess what? You've got your life, but now you have to live without your money. Lacan's point here is that to choose life is to choose a life of lack where you have lost something. Yeah, you get to live, but you get to live in a field of incompletion, in a field of lack, in a field structured by desire. The same, of course, is true um, in, the, in the older, um, more Hegelian theme of uh, your, your freedom or your life. Um, if you think back to the phenomenology of spirit, the, 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 one of the dilemmas of the master is that they show up and they meet somebody and they're like, okay, this is going to go down. Either you're my master and I'm your slave, or I'm the master and you're the slave, but it's going to go down. It's a fight to the death. And you can choose in that moment. You can choose your freedom or your life. If you choose your freedom against a stronger opponent, in other words, I will not be your slave. Well, okay, prepare to lose your life as well. If, however, you choose life over freedom, in other words, if you accept servitude, fine, I'll bake the cake for you. Just stop hitting me with the stick. I'd rather live without my freedom than choose my freedom and lose my life. This is another way to get at the dilemma of the split subject. If you choose the field of being, you lose almost everything. If you choose the field of meaning, you have to live a life of lack in the field of the symbolic where you can only ever show up in petrified, faded, fucked up form. I didn't come here to talk to you about this, but it's important stuff for us to discuss. There's no doubt about it. Because it brings us to this third field of structural lack known as separation. I'm willing to move forward here because there's so much good stuff out there on alienation, on these very passages. And you'll notice if you check out our lectures on seminar 11, we don't spend much time working on this stuff on alienation. We go straight for the drive at the end of seminar 11. We don't mess around with this stuff. There's lots of abundant secondary literature, some of which is good. Um, be careful. Separation, though, um, is, is what's at stake here. This third field of structural lack with which we began today. And I told you that sexuation has to do with a real lack relative to the living organism. Alienation has to do with its symbolic imaginary lack relative to the subject. Separation, though, yes, the lack experienced by the subject is relevant. But in the field of separation, what also emerges is a lack in the field of the other, the barred other, barred big other, shows up in the field of separation. And this, for us, is fundamental to understanding how Lacan starts Seminar 14. The primary stake in understanding seminar 14 is understanding why and how the big other is barred. But it starts being introduced to us here in seminar 11. So let's think about this for a second. 
The structural logic of separation is not joining, which we saw as that of alienation, where you focus on the mutually exclusive elements in each set. The structural logic of separation is that of intersection or production. It's an emphasis, in other words, on the elements that belong to both sets. So your money or your life, being or meaning, freedom or your life, these are either ors. If you choose one, you can't have the other. If you choose the other, you can't have the one. Ooh, see how I just did that? Here though, in the field of separation, what matters is the way that these two spheres sets intersect. Zebras and penguins. Now there's some shit that zebras do that's just about zebras. And there's some shit that penguins do that's just about penguins. But by God, if there aren't some intersections between these two species, both are warm-blooded. Both tend to privilege two colors, black and white. And both, I mean, think about this with zebras and penguins. They are, they're spectacularly collective. What zebras and penguins do as groups is just nuts. For predators of every stripe, lions and winters alike. What intersects in separation is again the subject and the other for Lacan. And it is again occurring in this field of lack, at the level of lack. But it's the other's lack more than the subjects that is at stake in the experience known as separation. And here Lacan is driving at one key concept, the desire of the other. A key concept that for him was fundamental in seminar 10 on anxiety. It is the other's desire more than the subjects the others lack more than the subjects that is popping in the experience of separation. It's the desire of the other and the subjects encounter with this desire that occurs in separation. So check out pages 213 to 214. 14, even up to 215, the very end of this chapter in seminar 11 on alienation is, is a terrific um, foray into this stuff, even though at the end there's kind of this weird detour into self-mortification. Um, not irrelevant, but uh, might be a little far afield, but check out page 213. Lacan tries to spell out some of this stuff, again with the emphasis on logic. Given the time, I can do no more than introduce the second operation. Here, it's separation. It completes the circularity of the relation of the subject to the other, but an essential twist is revealed in it. Here again is that passage with which we began, the circular but non-reciprocal relationship between the subject and the other. I'm really working hard to get us here in a logical mindset, in a very strict sense that is the only stake. In, these, um, in this opening part of our lecture. Whereas the first phase, alienation, is based on the substructure of joining the either or, mutually exclusive. The second is based on the substructure called intersection or product. It is situated precisely in that same lunula in which you find the form of the gap the rim. The intersection of the two sets is constituted by the elements that belong to the two sets. Set, 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 set. Lacan is thinking again back to not just any form of symbolic logic. He is thinking back to set theory. Lacan does two great things with math. First, he develops his own algebra which for him is the way that you, is one of the ways that psychoanalysis can be shown to be a science because it can be mathematized. Lacanian psychoanalysis has these algebras, not just to keep, to help everybody keep his formulas straight. It's him showing you 
that the basic laws of mathematics can be applied to psychoanalysis. That's how fucking scientific psychoanalysis is. You can mathematize that shit. Show me the mathematics of literary theory. The other thing that Lacan does that's really smart with mathematics is he draws on set theory. And this is exactly how you get, again, someone like Alain Badiou. Badiou is better than Lacan at math and better than Lacan at one particular kind of math, which is set theory. Badiou is brilliant with this stuff. And what he's able to do with Lacan is what Lacan couldn't do for himself because Lacan, frankly speaking, is not that great of a mathematician. Thank goodness you got Badiou to read next. The intersection of two sets is constituted by the elements that belong to the two sets. It is here that the second operation in which the subject is led by this dialectic takes place. Again, we're talking about separation here. It is as essential to define the second operation as the first, because it is there that we shall see the emergence of the field of the transference. I shall call it introducing my second new term here, separation. So what I'm trying to do is call us right back to the point in Lacan's thought when he really starts thinking hard about the structure of lack experienced in the field of the big other, a lack at the center, perhaps even right on the periphery, on the edge of the symbolic. And then notice this move he makes, separare, to separate. Lacan is never too far removed from the etymology of the terms he chooses. Here's a great example of him drawing out what it means, showing you why he's choosing this particular word. I would point out at once the equivocation of the se parare, of the se parare in parer in all the fluctuating meanings it has in French. It means not only to dress oneself, but also to defend oneself to provide oneself with what one needs, to be on one's guard, and I will go further still, and Latinus will bear me out. To say parere is the whoop, and to be engendered, which is involved here. To separate is in some very real sense for the subject to learn how to dress themselves and defend themselves, and in so doing, to engender themselves. The separation at stake in separation, a separation that would only occur, I, I submit, um, when the fundamental fantasy is traversed, which we'll come to in a second, is a separation of the subject from the big other. When you can dress, defend, and in so doing, engender yourself, you're separating from the big other. How, at this level, has the subject to procure himself? For that is the origin of the word that designates the Latin to engender. And then we get some more etymology, to put into the world. We can go on and on with this stuff, but um, we're short on time and I'm moving fast. So let's keep that up. At the bottom of the next paragraph, Lacan talks about this notion of intersection again. We shall see how it emerges from the superimposition of two lacks. That is what we're after here. That's what we're looking for. There are two lacks at work in separation, the subjects and the others, and they are superimposed. So what is the shared element between subject and other? where they intersect in the field of separation is what allows us to talk about this, is in the field of lack. What they both share is an experience of loss, of lack, of missing something. And what Lacan's going to say is they share this, and insofar as they share it, these lacks are somehow superimposed on each other. They're wrapped up in each other. A lack is encountered by the subject in the other, in the very intimation that the other makes to him by his discourse. 
In other words, by simply speaking to the child, the parent demonstrates that they are lacking. In the intervals of the discourse of the other, there emerges in the experience of the child something that is radically mappable, namely, he is saying this to me, but what does he want? He is saying this to me, but what does he want? Already you can see the basic definition of fantasy popping up here. What does the other want? The mathem of the fantasy, a split subject living their life in relation to what they think other people want from them, for them. In this interval intersecting the signifiers, which forms part of the very structure of the signifier, is the locus of what in other registers of my exposition I have called metonymy. Don't worry about that. It is there that what we call desire crawls, slips, escapes like the ferret. Worry about that. The, met the metonymic structure he's talking about there, think more along the lines of a ferret that crawls, slips, and escapes. The desire of the other is apprehended by the subject in that which does not work, in the lacks of the discourse of the other, also fundamental here. It's in the field of errancy, where something malfunctions. It's in inoperativity, inoperative moments in the symbolic that you see the desire of the other. And you see this being played out, Lacan says, in all the child's whys. Now, people say, oh, Lacan's so tough to read. He never gives examples. Nah, man, the truth is people who say that shit don't read Lacan carefully enough. Here's a great example. All of those children asking why. And if you've ever had this interaction with a kid, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Iris, the sky is blue. Why? Because the artist told us it was blue. Why? Because they wanted to paint a picture. Why? Because they were hurt when they were children. Why? Because hurt people hurt people, Iris. All of the child's wise reveal not so much an avidity for the reason of things as a testing of the adult, a why are you telling me this? That's what's up. When little kids are asking you why, 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 they're not trying to learn about the fucking world. They're trying to feel you out. It's not about the world. It's about the other. It's about you. Those questions are addressed to you and they are aimed at one field of experience alone. And that is your experience of desire. Why, why, why is the same question over and over again. Why are you telling me this? Ever resuscitated from its base, which is the enigma of the adult's desire. All of the child's questionings of why show them trying to sort out the enigma of the parent's desire. Not just what you want and why you want, but why do you want it from me? Now, you can see how we also, again, are butting up against fantasy from another direction. It's the child's imagination of what the other might want that's driving a lot of this, which is why ownership of your own projections onto others is important here. Let's see if we can summarize some of this. Main point, the desire of the other is signified and it finds its signifier, think the upper graph of desire, signification of lack in the other. It finds its signification, this lack that is the cause of the other's desire. If you want to know where it comes from, look for the spots where the other starts to break down. 
in that which does not work. It's in what's lacking in the discourse of the other, in the symbolic, that we start seeing questions about the desire of the other being put. So here is then the underlying question in all this. What exactly is missing and or malfunctioning? What is lost and or errant in the symbolic? And where in lived experience do we encounter this? This is the fundamental question of separation. At least the fundamental, I mean, structural, logical question of separation. If it's true that the signifier of lack in the other emerges in that which does not work, or in an, in an evidence of lack, an ex videre of lack, a, a showing of lack, where do we see this? What does it look like when it pops up? Answering this question about the fundamental structural logic of the lack in the other is precisely what Lacan sets out to do in seminar 14. And I say sets out because we're at the beginning of this seminar. And he is again operating at the level of a lack in the other whose logic is structural. Teasing this out, of his first lectures is what we're going to try and do next. But you know what? I would be remiss if we didn't at least finish what we were doing with seminar 11. Because the question I have in reading this here on page 214 to 215 is how does the split subject reply to signifiers of lack in the big other? Now, this is the, kind of a little detour from where we're headed, but it's kind of lit if you think about it. What Lacan here says is that the subject superimposes their lack upon that of the other and assumes that what the other wants, what the parent wants, is the child's own disappearance, the child's own death. This is mainly for the clinicians in the room. What comes of this superimposition of the subject's lack on the other's lack, the child's experience of split subjectivity on the evidence they see that their parents are also split. When the child superimposes their experience of lack on the evidence of the other's lack that they encounter, what they come up with is a fantasy of their own death. Lacan repeats that, the fantasy of one's death on page 214 and 215. The parent not only wants my lack, wants what I don't have. Those of you that were here for seminar 10, you know what I'm talking about. This is the cause of anxiety. When your lack has been taken from you by a bigger, badder, desirous other. One of the people who listened to that um, seminar, believe it or not, they, they got a, a tattoo of a praying mantis on their knee and it's fucking fire too. This tattoo, when her leg is open, it's on the side of her knee, the praying mantis is all up and shit. But then when her leg closes, the praying mantis is in a totally different position. It's phenomenal. It was just a phenomenal fucking piece. Um, wow. Uh, the bigger, badder other that shows up desirous and unhinged is according to the child after one thing in particular, um, the child's lack, which is to say the child's ability to desire. Again, I'm not gonna go into this, but it's part of what's happening here. The parent not only wants my lack, which produces a state of anxiety around that, but, and here's the important part Lacan's adding, they also want me to be absent from their life. From life itself. They want me to become lack, this fantasy of death. Here's what I would add. Neither of these experiences, the anxiety that comes from encountering the desire of a bigger other, nor the self-mortifying fantasy 
that it fuels is bearable. Anxiety and self-mortification are unbearable. So what the subject, the child here does is they build another more palatable fantasy. And this is what Lacan means whenever he talks about the fundamental fantasy. The fundamental fantasy of the child is not that the parent wants them to be dead. The fundamental fantasy is a defense against that superimposition of lack that results in this angst-filled, self-mortifying fantasy. The fundamental fantasy is a reaction to that. The fundamental fantasy is not that the other is lacking and thus desirous. The fundamental fantasy is that the other is in fact complete, whole, whole, and as a result does not experience desire but can instead issue demands. The fundamental fantasy shows the child saying, not why are you saying this to me? Not what do you want from me? But instead something a little different. I know you know what you want from me. So out with it, demand it of me. This is the fundamental fantasy, that the big other is not desirous, but demanding. That the big other is not barred, but whole. Not lacking, but full and complete. As we know, this bottoms out. Because ultimately, in the bottom of the barrel of this fundamental fantasy is only one demand. Show me your castrated. Psychoanalysis is about traversing this fundamental fantasy in a way that if you want to keep playing with the verse etymology, reverses its development, allowing the subject to recover and recover from the experience of desirous others and anxious selves. This, in terms of a therapeutic technique, is what Lacan envisions as the end of analysis. It's not the end of experience, but it signals the end of analysis when the fundamental fantasy can be marched back to this other scarier, more unbearable fantasy of a desirous other, a fantasy that the other is desirous and what they fundamentally want is for you not to exist. Recovering that experience and recovering from it is the horizon of separation, signaling the end of analysis. Now, before we take a break, I want to add one more thing. Beyond this threshold, this traversing of the fundamental fantasy, there is something else. And this might even be the fourth fold in the three structural lacks with which we started. There is something for the subject beyond the fundamental fantasy after analysis is complete. Not desire and anxiety, but drive and its satisfaction. And with drive and its satisfaction, the subject has access to an experience of jouissance, of enjoyment, that is, hear me now, desublimated but non-transgressive, deeply embodied but thoroughly mediated through the symbolic, and recuperative of libido, this lost, polymorphous, typically perverse experience of proto-enjoyment 
But all of that is occurring always within the field of castration. And we don't have time to get into all of this, but it's a fitting cap on the work that we're doing here. Again, um, if, if, you've, if this trips your trigger and you're really interested, go back, check out our lectures on the drive. This is all developed there. But I want to show you that beyond sexuation, alienation, and separation, there is this other experience, this other field of jouissance that is accessed by way of the drive, where it's not desire that motivates subjectivity, but something different. The word we have for that is the drive. And I would ask you to also think about this logic as circular. What the fourth field of structural lack in Lacan does in the field of the drive is it brings us back to the very first one with which we began, sexuation. What the drive allows us to do is to recover and restore the libido that we lost when we had to pass through the bipolar straits of sexuality. That's why these lacks are circular. If there's a fourth, and I believe there is, at the level of the erogenous zone, at the level of the unconscious, all these openings and mouths on the human body, it opens us back up onto the lack um, experienced in sexuation. Uh, let's pause there and take some questions. I know there are going to be some. Uh, let me hear what you got to say. Yeah, I had a quick question, Sam. <clears throat> and, and I might be reading this wrong, and please tell me if I am. Uh, so the child's desire to vanish from the parents, is that because then the child becomes the desire of the parents, becomes a lack? Like they, that by, by disappearing, then they become the parent's lack, and therefore, like, they're almost immortalized then? Does that make sense? I could see that, yeah. I mean, there is... Um, um there's something fundamentally narcissistic, maybe, right. um, maybe even primarily narcissistic about assuming that you're, the, that you're the object of all of your parents, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever they feel, it's because of something that has to do with you, um, even if it is your own mortification. Right, even if right. they want you dead, at least you're wanted. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was my problem with that 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 TV show, Thirteen Reasons, that talked about teen suicide, where it's like the whole show centered around everybody coming to deal with their their how they confronted the person who committed suicide. So it kind of showed that, like, if you commit suicide, everybody around you then all of a sudden cares for you. Yeah, there's some great work. Um, I'm on a dissertation committee right now with a doctoral uh, student in clinical psychology. Um, she's doing gr a great project on suicide letters using um, the discourse of the analyst as a way to kind of like work through the, um, the aggressive desirous logics that are occurring at the level of the suicide letter. And of course, not just at the level of the letter, but at the level of the act that may or may not be passed to after the letter. So um, there, there's new stuff that's going to be coming out on this pretty soon. I really hope this becomes a, a book project. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, such a, it's such a wild, wild topic. But I think you're right. Yeah, even if they want me dead, at least I'm wanted. <laughs> <laughs> 214 and 215 is where we were, by the way, if you're, if you're wondering where this is coming from. Um, it, you know, at some level too, Lacan is even asking the question, like, is it even possible? The child is even wondering at this level, is it even possible for you to lose me? Could that even happen? You know, people talk about like childhood and, you know, oh my gosh, it's so great and all this kind of stuff. I kind of doubt it, man. I mean, being an infant, it sounds fucking terrifying. 
And being, being a child at this level and having these fantasies, but not being able to bring them to words. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a wonder that we all don't die of strokes before the age of three. What a terrifying experience. And then you all think like, you think middle school was bad. You think high school was bad. Holy fuck, imagine being three. Um, great, thank you for that question. What else is on your mind out there? If you haven't already, you should read the last sentence of the chapter that we just spent an hour and a half working through. The last sentence on page 215. I think I have sufficiently stressed the two elements that I have tried to present today in this new and fundamental logical argument. Lacan the logician. This series could be called Logics on Lacan. And here it is, non-reciprocity and the twist in the return, a circular structure that is non-reciprocal, probably at the level of alienation, and with a twist at the end in the field of separation. So much good stuff here. There's um, some folks have approached me and asked me to, to teach a class on 11. Um, I think it's it's probably a pay to play thing because it's through a university. But I have to say, um, having just taught 11, I'm super stoked to get back into it. I don't know why. I've read this seminar like two or three times now and I just love it. And I love it more now than ever that we've worked through the drive. If you've got time for one book, one seminar by Lacan, make it 11. 11's fire. No, wait, I mean, make it 14. Seminar 14 is the amazing seminar. One more question. What's up, what's going on? All right, if you're good, then let's take a 10 minute break. It's 1130 right now. We are halfway through on the nose. Let's take a 10 minute break, get coffee, insert some liquids, express others, and come back here at in 10 minutes, whatever time it is where you are. Um, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Pacific time, Californians, that means 1140. Hey again. It's been 10 minutes. And you know what time it is? Um, it's time to get into seminar 14. And my hope is that we can arrive at some, some bumper stickers for this first bit on seminar 14, the logic of fantasy. Um, the emphasis is on logic to start with. There ain't much talk of fantasy in the first 60, 70 pages of the logic of fantasy. There is, however, a lot of talk of that barred big other. Um, I'm not entirely sure where Lacan is heading with seminar 14. Um, but I am damn certain where he begins 
which is where we just left off with the structural logic of the bard big other. Now, in Lacanian discourse, we oftentimes hear a couple of catchphrases around this topic of the barred other. We oftentimes hear there is no other of the other. And we also often hear there is no meta language. Both of these bumper stickers in their own right can be traced back to Lacan's structural logical thinking around the barred other. Both are anchored, I would suggest, in Lacan's reading of set theory, which Lacan adjusts and adapts to his notion of the symbolic. So work with me on this. Check out pages 10 to 11 of seminar 14. And if yours looks anything like mine, You can find this online, readily available, thank goodness. Um, you know, for those of us that speak the imperial language of English, um, there is an English translation produced um, at Lacan in Ireland. It's not a fabulous translation, but it's better than the non-translation that those of us without fluent French would have to work through. This is a great starting place. It'd be wonderful to see this translation um, copy edited, updated, tested, tried and trued relative to the other standard English translations of Lacan's work. Even so, it's hella legible. So let's take a look at pages 10 through 11. It's at the end of Lacan's first lecture, pages 10 to 11. I'm at the bottom of page 10. Take a second and find this if you haven't already downloaded it and checked it out. Again, take a moment right now to uh, run an internet search, find the logic of fantasy, seminar 14, and join me here at the bottom of page 10. Let's pay careful attention to what's happening here. You'll see in the last paragraph on page 10, set theory is introduced. And then it gets a little wonky. He's messing around about X not being a member of itself. That's important. But the last two lines is where the fun starts for us. What is proper to the totality of signifiers I will show it to you in detail, involves the following as necessary. If we simply admit that the signifier cannot signify itself, involves the following as necessary, that there is something that does not belong to this set. It is not possible to reduce language simply because of the fact that language cannot constitute a closed set. In other words, there is no universe of discourse. Now we've talked about the etymology of universe, to make one, to turn stuff into one, to unite is a good way to understand what's happening here with the universe. But don't forget that the UN at the front of universe doesn't just mean one, in French derived from the Latin unus one, but also has this other meaning in German and English, for instance, where un, un is a negation. It means not in addition to one. This play will become incredibly important in Lacan's stuff and may even allow us to dip back into seminar 11, which is all I wanna do now. Um, but there is some good stuff in seminar 11 on this uh, that you've heard from me before, but it might be worth returning to just to spell it out. First and foremost, let's get some things ironed out about the big other, the symbolic. In the bottom right-hand corner of the graph of desire, you see this A with a circle around it. 
this is the locus of the other, of the big other, and it is not barred. It is considered full. It is a treasure trove of all the words in a given language. It is a treasure trove of all the signifiers in the signifying chain. The point that Lacan is driving at here is that this container of all signifiers, words, things, et cetera, is in fact incomplete. There's always something missing from this totalizing set known as the symbolic, the big other language. There's always something that does not belong to it. And what I wanna do is tell you exactly what that is in seminar 14. There's a lot to it, but here's fundamentally what he's talking about here. What is not included in the set known as the symbolic, known as the big other, is the big other, is the symbolic. The container is not included among its contents. And any time in the next hour, when you feel like things are getting a little weird, just remember this. Lacan is fundamentally working with the structural logic of containers and things contained. And the fact that containers are not among their contents. This is why he says there's no other of the other. Because at some level, what the big other lacks is a big other that could encompass it the way that it encompasses everything else in the world. There is no other of the other. And that is what the big other lacks, is a relationship to the big other like it imposes on everything that it circumscribes. That's what it lacks, is a big other of its own, a container in which itself can become a contained entity. Uh, it's the same with meta language. There is no meta language because in order to talk about language, you have to use language. You can't have a language that is above language because it's a language, so it's still in the field of language. There's no meta language. There's no language about language. Every language about language is just an extension of language. This is what he's getting at here. Not surprisingly, he then shifts to Russell's paradox, the one we were just talking about. For those of you who may have had some difficulty in understanding what I have just formulated, I will recall simply the following, which I already said at the appropriate time, that the truths that I have just stated are simply those which appeared in a confused fashion at the naive period of the establishment of set theory in the form of what is wrongly called Russell's paradox, because it's not a paradox, it's an image, the catalog of all catalogs which do not contain themselves. There it is again. We just heard it in seminar 11. Here it is popping up right at the start, 11 pages into seminar 14. What does that mean? Either it contains itself or it contradicts its definition or it does not contain itself and in that case fails in its mission. So think about this really quickly. Russell's paradox is to imagine a catalog of all catalogs which do not contain themselves. Then the question becomes, should this catalog of catalogs be included among the catalogs that it contains? If it does not include itself, then it has to be included because it would in that case be a catalog that does not contain itself. If, however, it does include itself, then it has to be excluded from its own categorization because now it's a catalog that does contain itself. That's what Lacan means here when he says, either it contains itself or it contradicts its definition. Note this either or popping again. Or it does not contain itself and in that case fails in its mission. If it doesn't contain itself, it's a failure because that is one catalog that is not contained in its totalizing set of all catalogs that don't contain itself. That makes 
the mission of this catalog of catalogs of failure. If it contains itself, well, let's leave it at there, that for now. I don't want to get us too much in the weeds on this one. Um, I love it that Lacan says this isn't a paradox at all. It's an image. Brilliant. One has only to declare, and this is the important part, that in making such a catalog, one cannot take things all the way and for good reasons. What those reasons are remain to be seen. What we're gonna try and understand now is why you can't take things all the way. Why the symbolic can never go all the way. Why the big other can never fully account in a totalizing fashion as it purports to why the big other is never a complete treasure trove, why it's always lacking at least one thing. But what I earlier gave you the statement of, in the formula that the universe of discourse, that in the universe of discourse, there is nothing that contains everything. This is something which properly speaking, encourages us to be particularly prudent here as regards the handling of what is called whole and part and requires us at the origin to distinguish very severely. This will be the object of my next lecture, the one from the totality. Very important theme here. The one, capital O, one, from the totality. Which precisely I have just refuted because there can't be a totality. Saying that at the level of discourse, there is no universe. There is no counting as one. You can make things count as one, but only in a way that places under erasure the incompletion, necessary incompletion of that count, which we'll discuss with lots of examples. So hang tight. Which undoubtedly leaves still more in suspense whether we can suppose it to be anywhere else to distinguish this one from the countable one. So the one in question for Lacan is not the countable one. It's not the one that is a universe, a made into one. There's a one that Lacan wants to discuss, an un, that is separate from sets where you've gathered things into one collection, a universe. And that's the problem with the universe, is that there's always one thing, too many, that hasn't been counted. There's always an additional one still to count. And why is this important? Because this one that is not counted in the totalizing set of the symbolic, of the big other, of society, whatever you want to call it, it slips and slides like the ferret we discussed in seminar 11 and can only be the one by repeating itself at least once. I think this is the trickiest part in the readings that we're discussing now, is the idea of, repetit of repetition and repeating itself only once, and closing in on itself to establish at the origin the lack involved, namely, the one involved in the establishment of the subject. And I would advise you to hear him say, when he says the one involved in the establishment of the subject, as a figure of that capital O one that is not counted by the symbolic, and also as a figure of the lack that he just referred to there as well. This is effectively Lacan's introduction to seminar 14. So on the one hand, you have something that is countable as one a collection of things that can be gathered together and grouped into, I don't know, one language, one society, one city block. You can gather all the houses up and say, this is one city block. We can make all of these houses count as one. It's a totalization of all the houses on that block. Lacan's point, though, is that these totalizing efforts are always incomplete for some structural, logical reason. There's always something that is being left out, necessarily so. So fantasies of wholeness, plenitude, completion, 
And if you've got ears to hear, I am talking about the fundamental fantasy that the subject has relative to the big other, that the child has relative to the parent. The fundamental fantasy, in other words, that these are not desirous big others, but demanding big others. They don't lack, they are full. That's the fundamental fantasy. The fundamental fantasy to be traversed in psychoanalysis is that the big other is whole, complete, full, in a way that you are not. And as a result, can and should issue demands instead of doing what we experience on a daily basis, which is confront us with desire. The symbolic is the register in which things are made to count as one. But then there's this other place this other register. I hesitate to use register here, but it serves us well enough. Not where things are made to count as one, grouped together like houses on a city block, but something that is a one that is necessarily excluded from that earlier count. Here is a one as un in the sense of not, in the sense of negation, as cut, as we will see as unary trait, U-N-A-R-Y trait. There's that U-N again. Here, what we see is not the symbolic, but the subject, the split subject. And where else are we now but precisely in that either or of being and meaning that we saw in the early 200s of Seminar 11? There's the other and the field of meaning that purports to have an answer to all questions. And then there is the field of being, which entails the split subject. In a very real sense, Seminar 14 is picking up where Lacan leaves off in Seminar 11 on the topic of alienation and separation. And remember, the big theme here is containers and contents. Containers are not among their contents. Hold that thought as we move forward here. And moving forward, we are. Page 25 to 26 is the next stop on this walk through. But you may be surprised or perhaps not surprised to hear that this next stop on pages 25 and 26, I fooled you, are back to seminar 11. Pages 25 to 26 of seminar 11 are terrific on this topic. Seminar 11 on page 25, gives you a definition of the unconscious that is brilliant, simple, completely accessible, utterly true, showing you just how Freudian Lacan actually is. At the bottom though, he introduces this question of a totality. It's at the bottom of page 25 of seminar 11. He talks about the unconscious as a phenomenon of discontinuity, a rupture, a break, an interruption, cesura. And then he asks, must this discontinuity, this interruption that is the unconscious occur against the background of a totality, a collection of all things? I'm not gonna spend much time with this because we've already worked on it extensively in our lectures on seminar 11, but it's worth rehearsing here. Is the one top of page 26, anterior to discontinuity. I have to say, this is one of the questions that comes up constantly in discussions of Lacanian psychoanalysis. I get this all the time. What was there before the symbolic? What was there before the discontinuity, the rupture, the cut, the blah, 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 that produced the split subject? What was that like? 
And you know, the question itself tells you a lot about where folks are and, and what they want of this world. And I think what, it, what that question belies is a fantasy of psychoanalysis that promises to return you to a state of Edenic bliss, wholeness and completion. At the end of analysis, I'll feel whole. I'll feel like I did before I was split. And that whole line of thought is just ridiculous. It doesn't even comport conceptually or clinically with what Lacan is up to. But nevertheless, it keeps coming up as a question. What was there before the process of alienation? Well, here and in our previous lectures, I've told you sexuation was there. Okay, well, what was there before sexuation in the field of this living organism? Lacan has one answer for this. What was there before, he says, is the here and now of the all in a process of becoming. It's just a big smear of life. And should we consider this as a whole, Edenic, unified experience, where before we were split, we were whole? Here's how Lacan answers that question. And if you've ever asked it to me and wondered why I showed, I say, turn to page 26 of seminar 11. Here's the reason why. Is the one anterior to discontinuity? I do not think so. And everything that I have taught in recent years has tended to exclude this need for a closed one. You see, that's the dilemma of the symbolic that Lacan's getting into in seminar 14 at the start. So the symbolic, like the big other, purports to be a closed one. And our fundamental fantasies prop that up. We want it to be a closed one because that's easier to deal with than a leaky one. It's easier to imagine others to be complete and thus demanding than it is to grapple with their incompletion and by extension, their desire. This closed one is for Lacan, a mirage to which is attached the reference to the enveloping psyche, a sort of double of the organism in which this false unity is thought to reside. You will grant me that the one that is introduced by the experience of the unconscious, here Lacan is gonna tell you what he means by the one, is the one of the split of the stroke of the rupture. Here are the two ones that we were just talking about. There's the countable as one, this fantasy that there is a universe of discourse. And then there is this other one as cut, as stroke, as rupture. And notice how Lacan turns the topic next. At this point, there springs up a misunderstood form of the un, the un of the unbewusste. Let us say that the limit of the unbewusste is the unbegriff, not the non-concept, but the concept of lack. That is a crucial paragraph here. The unbegriff, the non-concept, begriff, German for Think about grip. The English word grip comes from this. To get a grasp on something, to have a conceptualization, to comprehend something, to understand something, to conceptualize something, is to get a grip on it, to get un griff on it. Um, un begriff doesn't mean the non-concept, a lack of grasp. It is instead a grasp on lack. This other one for Lacan is a way for him to help us get a grasp on what is lacking from the totalizing efforts of the symbolic and the big other. A lack that is necessary, that is structural, that can't ever be filled. Okay, that's it. I'll stop with seminar 11 for a minute. Um, but I want to emphasize this. 
this grasp of lack is part and parcel to the claim you often hear here. When I say that psychoanalysis is a science of openings, of objectality, this is what I'm after. Psychoanalysis conceptually is about getting a grasp on openings. It's a science, but not one of objectivity where you're focused on stuff, but you're focused on openings. Science, modern science wants to wrap its head around stuff, entities. Psychoanalysis teaches us to wrap our heads around non-stuff, not places that are stuffed with meaning, but places where meaning has leaked out. It's not about objectivity, but about objectality. And this emphasis on the one as cut, rupture, opening, as non instead of totalization gets us closer to it. It's also why I say that the ontology of psychoanalysis is in fact a me ontology, a me ontology, from the Greek meon meaning non-being. Because what psychoanalysis does is it puts us into contact and helps us wrap our heads, our hands, and our hearts around the constitutive non-being, the mayon of humankind. You and me alike. Psychoanalysis is about getting a grip, not on being, Fuck being, non-being, because that is truly what's at the core of us, if there is one. And that's what he's turning to on pages seminar on seminar 11, pages 25 to 26. But let's focus on this structure of the big other, barred and otherwise, of this lack that I'm suggesting here is constitutive of the symbolics totalizing claim to represent everything, of languages perennial failure to account for all signifiers and so on. Consider the example on page 13, and it's page 13 of seminar 14, mind you now. This example's whack but it, it's here. So Lacan is hanging out, he's teaching his class, and apparently he tells somebody to get up and go to the board and write something. Madame, take this little piece of chalk, make a rectangle, write, and apparently she's writing, and then he says, no, make it very big, almost as big as the board, there you are. And then he tells her to write, one, two, three, four on the first line. No, inside the frame. One, two, three, four. And then write the smallest whole number, which is not written on the board beneath one, two, three, four. Folks start cracking up. And then he says again, no. Write the sentence, the smallest whole number, which is not written on the board. Now, there are two ways to read this. First, you could just focus on all the no's in here which I do not think are irrelevant. But it's probably more productive for us to focus on what is resulting from this little experiment. So this student writes on the board the diagram that we see beneath. There's a rectangle. In it are the numbers one, two, three, and four. And then there's also this sentence, the smallest whole number which is not written on the board. Now, the way to read this is that rectangle is a catalog. It's a set. It's a container. And everything that is inside it on the page here are the contents. So inside this rectangular container are the numbers one, two, three, and four, and the sentence, the smallest whole number, which is not written on this board. It's a little game. Lacan's full of these things. It's highly illustrative and puts us on the path to understanding what he's doing with containers and things contained. This could have been presented in a different form. Namely, instead of doing me the service which has been done, and I thank the person who was good enough to write this sentence that you see written out, that I could, without writing it, have asked you, or even if you wish, made a little person from whose mouth 
from those mouths there would emerge what they call in comic strips a bubble. Another wild way to read Seminar 14 at this point, notice his use of the word bubble. And here I'm not thinking of Slaughter Jike stuff on bubbles. I'm thinking of Lacan stuff on bubbles. And notice here, it's the bubble that would come out of a comic strip and have a cloud here and it would have written in it what it is that the person is saying on the page, what they're saying in writing as depict, you know, see, see what it's doing here. Someone would say in this, in this thought cloud or comic strip bubble, the smallest whole number, which is not written on this board. In which case you would all have been in agreement and I would have not contradicted you that it is the number five. So if the numbers one, two, three, and four are in this box, you have to ask yourself then, okay, what's the next smallest whole number, which is not yet included here? You say, oh, it's the number five. Okay, so five is what that sentence means. That sentence means five, because five is the smallest whole number, which is not yet included in that category. And Lacan says, I'm not gonna contradict you. Five sounds about right. It is clear that from the moment that this sentence is written, the smallest whole number, which is not written on the board, the number five being written there by this very fact is excluded. Wait, five is excluded? Hold up. You have only to search then whether the smallest whole number, which is not written on the board, might not perchance be the number six. Five is excluded because it is not written on the board. The number five is not written on the board. How about the number six? And you find yourself with the same difficulty, namely that from the moment you pose the question, the number six as the smallest whole number, which is not written on the board, basically you're fucked. And it goes on and on and on. This is the best use, by the way, of the psychoanalytic and so on, is right here. It's the and so on that is produced by this weird little kink in the game, an opening that can't help but be leaky. And if you're a logician, it looks paradoxical. For Lacan, it starts to look a lot more like lived experience. That's not the best one, though. I don't think that's the best paradox in all this. It gives us some stuff though. The fantasy of wholeness, completion, totality, plenitude, unity, that fuels our desirous pursuit of the smallest whole number not written on the board. Lacan then says is the poetic fantasy par excellence. So this fantasy that we could arrive at a total set of numbers, whole numbers here, small whole numbers on the board is not too different from what he says on page 20 is the poetic fantasy par excellence. Second illustration. It's not that Lacan doesn't have examples, it's that his examples are crazy, crazy good. So check out the middle paragraph on page 20 and remember what we're trying to figure out here. Something about the structural lack that the other always has. Here indeed is where there may be situated the fantasy. Oh, there's the word fantasy, which is properly the poetic fantasy par excellence. The one which obsessed Mallarmé, the absolute book the fantasy of the absolute book. Okay, if you don't know what this is, Lacan's gonna explain it. It's at this level where things are tied together at the level of the use, not of pure signifier, but of the purified signifier. Insofar as I say that I write, that I say that the signifier is here articulated as distinct from any signified, I then see there being outlined the possibility of this absolute book. And then he tells us what it is after all that, whose property would be that it would encompass the whole signifying chain. So the absolute book is the book that includes every possible element in the signifying chain. 
letter, word, sentence, paragraph, and the like. The problem here, though, is that if it does that, it may no longer signify anything. In this, then, there is something that proves to be founded in existence at the level of the universe of discourse. But we have to suspend this existence on the proper logic which that of the fantasy may constitute, because moreover, it is the only one that can tell us the way in which this region is attached to the universe of discourse. Undoubtedly, it is not excluded that it should enter it, but on the other hand, it is quite certain that it specifies itself in it, not at all by this purification of which I spoke earlier, for purification is not at all possible of what is essential to the universe of discourse, namely meaning. And were I to speak to you for another four hours about this absolute book, it would nevertheless remain that everything that I tell you has a sense. So even this example, Lacan is not quite ready to go down the road with this one. The part that we like about this is that it points out this fantasy of wholeness, completion, totality that is very much at the root of the fundamental fantasy that is to be traversed in psychoanalysis, that the big other is whole, complete, not lacking. Okay, let's see if we can put a summary to this. Bounce down a little bit more on page 20, about eight lines up from the bottom. We're getting closer. By simply closing the chain, there are results that each group of four can easily leave outside itself the extraneous number. Wait, what is he talking about? This is one of those weird moments in Lacan. The summary that we want is here, but the example to which he's referring is not the one he just spoke of, not the book of all things. It's a page back on page 19 where he's doing this shit with A, B, C, D, and E. Wouldn't it be great if Lacan had introduced the example of the book of absolute everything and then done the A, B, C, and D and E because then we could get the summary right after that? Of course it would. That would be a lot easier to read than what we're doing right now. But it would not remain true to what Lacan says at the start of seminar 11, which is I'm a poem. In every bit of the sense, when Lacan steps up onto the stage, he is performing the unconscious. Your dream does not move in logical, coherent, sequential order. Actually, it does have a logic, but its logic is not sequential, chronological, the way we experience reality which is not the real, but reality. When Lacan is teaching this material, he wants to embody as much as possible the strange poetry that occurs at the level of the unconscious, which you see every night when you close your eyes and have that dream where one thing leads to another in a completely non-sequential, surprising way. So here, we've got a summary at the bottom of page 20 but it's a summary of the example that occurred on page 19, not the one we just heard. So you have to be able to do this kind of leaping around. The second thing to note about this is Lacan believes that attending his seminars were part of the process of training in psychoanalysis because listening to him work through this material is not so different from listening to an analyst's hand talk through some crazy ass shit, or at least that's his wager. That aside, let's get to this other example, another example of what he's trying to get at around containers and things contained, this logic. Page 19, there's Russell's paradox again. I'm not gonna bother you with that silly logic, but Lacan is. A catalog of catalogs, he says, in the middle of 19. Here indeed, in a first approach, is what is involved as a signifier. What sh why should we be surprised that it does not contain itself? Naturally, since this seems to us to be required from the beginning. 
Nevertheless, there is nothing to prevent the catalog of all catalogs, which do not contain themselves, from printing itself inside it. In truth, nothing would prevent it, even the contradiction that Lord Russell would deduce from it. So Lacan is not giving a fuck about contradiction because he's thinking at the level of the unconscious, which adheres to a principle of non-contradiction, among others. But let us consider precisely this possibility that exists in order not to contradict itself. It does not inscribe itself in itself. So Lacan's saying, I don't buy all this bullshit that Russell's putting out. It's not a paradox at all when you think at the level of the unconscious. But let's just play it out. Let's play it out as though we're symbolic logicians and that this really is paradoxical. That you cannot have a catalog of catalogs that do not contain itself. That that leads you into an aporia of sorts. Let's take the first catalog. There are only four catalogs up to then which do not contain themselves. Here they are, catalog A, B, C, and D. Let us suppose that there appears another catalog, which does not contain itself. We add it on. It's the letter E. Why is it inconceivable to think that there is a first catalog which contains A, B, C, and D, and a second catalog which contains B, C, D, and E? and not be surprised that each of them lacks this letter, which is properly the one that would designate itself. So here's how to think about this. Catalog one would be designated by the letter E, and it would contain the letters A, B, C, and D. Catalog two is designated by the letter A, and it contains B, C, D, and E. That's what he's messing with here. So you have a letter that is exterior to, external to this other grouping of letters. And that external letter is the designator, the name, if you will, the signifier of that catalog. So E is the signifier of the catalog that contains A, B, C, and D. And A is the signifier of a catalog that contains B, C, D, and E. Okay, you ready for the shit to turn up a little bit? But from the moment that you generate this sequence, you have only to arrange it around the circumference of a disk to see that it is not because in each catalog, one of them will be missing. Indeed, even a greater number that the circle of these catalogs will not add up to something which is precisely what corresponds to the catalog of all the catalogs which do not contain themselves. For this, we're going to need to turn to some imagery. So hold tight, y'all. I'm going to pull up the, the tablet here and... Uh, and see if we can diagram some of this in ways that might be helpful. So can you all see the black screen in front of you? Show me a thumbs up if you can, right on. Okay, so the first thing that he's messing with is a catalog one that would be called E and it would contain the letters A, B, C, and D. Then you'd have catalog two. It would be called A. This is the signifier that designates it. And it would contain B, C, D, and E. There you have it. Now what he's saying is, let's re-diagram this. You, have to, you always have to wonder in these moments um, whether it's going to be worth it. Lacan asks you to do all this work. You're like, man, is this going to fucking pay off? Because I'm working pretty damn hard here to try and understand all this. This one pays off. So bear with me here. Then he says, now arrange this around the circumference of a disk. So each of these catalogs gets arranged around the circumference of a disk. 
And how are we to arrange these things around the circumference of a disk? Well, very simply, in the middle is a hole. I'm sure you already can sense where I'm headed with this. And here are, you can arrange them however the hell you want. You know what this is? This is like, um, this is like the Bob Ross of psychoanalysis. I'm gonna put a happy little hole here. And you know, this is your world. You can make it however you want. You can put your B up here, put your C down here, put your D right here. All right, let's get out some, uh, some titanium white here and see if we can make this liquid clear really pop. And of course, at that moment, if you watch Bob Ross, he will legit have like a baby squirrel in his pocket and the squirrel will come out and say, oh, this little critter here, it came out to my deck on, you know, in the mountains and I just couldn't let him go. Apparently that was a big problem with Bob Ross is that PBS had a hard time with him because first of all, he resisted his outfit. At some point, the Afro and the denim, everything, uh, he got tired of it. And they were like, no, bro, this is your outfit. It's part of your contract. The other thing though, was he was incorrigible with pet mice and squirrels and rabbits and shit. He was always showing up with animals legit in his pocket. And you'd be at a meeting and a squirrel would straight up crawl out of Bob Ross's pocket. I can't verify that part, but, um, but the man did like squirrels and talks a lot about it. Um, the real question here is why on earth would I bring up Bob Ross in this context? Connect those dots. So we've got these catalogs placed around a disc and one of the terms is missing and they don't add up to which is precisely corresponds to the catalog of all catalogs that are not contain themselves. Simply, of course, simply, Lacan says about six lines from the bottom of page 19 where we are. What will constitute this chain will have this property of being an additional signifier. It's important here. The E and the A, the E in catalog one and the A in catalog two is an additional signifier, which is constituted from the closure of the chain, an uncountable signifier and which because, precisely because of this fact, is able to be designated by a signifier. Because being nowhere, there is no difficulty in a signifier arising, which designates it as the additional signifier, the one that is not grasped in the chain. <clears throat> A and E are the ones that are not grasped in the chain. They are here, they are present, they are essential, they designate the closure of this thing and the containment therein, but they are not themselves included in it. They close the loop. They designate the closing of a loop around four entities in this case. They are additional signifiers that designate the grouping of these other four signifiers into closed sets. They, however, are not grasped or contained in those closed sets. What we have here are containers that are not among their contents. But the reality is that you couldn't have the latter without the former. You can't have those contents without having some designator marked by the container. So for instance, this applies to every box of cereal, jewelry, dicks, tricks, the like. The box is not among the cereal. The box is not jewelry. The box is not a dick. The box ain't a trick. Reminds me of that sequence Louis C.K. used to do. Remember Louis C.K. before he before he fucked up? <clears throat> no, before he got caught fucking up. Um, I hope he comes back someday, reformed and ready to crack us up again. But remember that time he says he's walking down the street, somebody leans out of the car door and says, hey, asshole, suck a bag of dicks. And Louis C.K. is like, 
what was that? What am I supposed to do? Like, how do you suck a bag of dicks? Like, do you do you pull out each dick individually and suck it? And then the question is, do you have to make it come? And then what do you do when when the dick is sucked? Do you like do you do you put it in a bowl like a like edamame at a sushi restaurant? Like you pull the shit, seeds come out of the shell, and then you put it in a bowl and you're done. But there's something else that that Louis C.K. does in this moment. Um, this disgusting example is, is quite relevant because he says, suck a bag of dicks. Um, do I take out each individual dick and suck it? Or do I put my mouth to the bag and start sucking? See how he's messing with this? He is fully acknowledging that the bag itself is part of the puzzle. It's not just which dicks to start with. It's what about the bag? I was told to suck a bag. It happens to be full of dicks, but you did tell me to suck a bag. So do I put the bag in my mouth? Lacan CK has figured out what we're revealing here, that there is this additional element that is not included in the bag of dicks, namely the bag itself. But if someone tells you to suck a bag of dicks, you can't help but wonder which one to start with. Among the ones that are included in the bag of dicks, the dicks themselves, or the mm that contains the bag of dicks, a different one. Which one do you start with when someone tells you to suck a bag of dicks? <clears throat> Which brings us to that summary on 20 that we just left off with. We went from the absolute book to the summary that we couldn't have to the A, B's, C's, and D's with stops along the way at Bob Ross and Louis C.K. Here's what we're after. In returning to Russell's paradox and continually bringing up this business of sets with elements that are essential to, but necessarily excluded from the sets themselves, Lacan's asking a simple question. How can the container be among its contents? But also, how can it not be among its contents if this container, like the symbolic and the big other, purports to encompass all things? Again, for those of you who read Badiou, this is basically what he's doing with the state. The state attempts to count for and account for all things, except itself. What it always leaves out of its totalizing count is the counting machine itself that the state actually is. And that's where we see opportunities for social change, radical and otherwise, by the sheer fact that it cannot leave itself out if it purports to encompass all things. Now, I leave these diagrams up here because after this summary, we're gonna have another example. The summary in question is at the bottom of page 20. By simply closing the chain, which we've done with these blue circles, there are results that each group of four can easily leave outside itself the extraneous signifier, the E and the A, which can serve to designate the group for the simple reason that it is not represented in it and that nevertheless, the whole chain will be found to constitute the totality of all these signifiers. B, C, D, and E, A, B, D, and C. Giving rise to this additional unit, uncountable as such, which is essential for the whole series of structures, which are precisely the ones on which I founded since the year 1960, my whole operation of identification. Boom. All of a sudden, it's revealed that what we're fucking talking about here is Lacan's theory of identification but he's not gonna stop there. Namely, what you find of it, for example, in the structure of the torus, 
boom, here's a great opportunity to understand what Lacan is doing topologically with this donut shaped figure of the Taurus. You know what donuts look like, right? I'm talking about the donuts that have holes popped out of the middle of them. The donut that is a ring that has an opening in the middle, it's three-dimensional, tubular, and so forth. You know the donut I'm talking about. It's a classic looking donut. In fact, it's the donut that looks a lot like the circles that you've got up on the screen in front of you. There's a hole in the middle and donut all around. I'm drawing donuts. That's what this is supposed to be. The structure of the torus being quite obvious that by buckling on the torus a certain number of circuits, top of page 21 now in seminar 14, by making operate a series of complete circuits at a cut and by making them the number that you like, naturally, the more of them there are, the more satisfying it is, but the more obscure it is. It is enough to make two of them to see their appearing at the same time, this third required for these two to buckle together. As I might say, for the line to bite its own tail. It will be this third circuit, which is assured by the buckling around the central hole through which it is impossible not to pass in order for the first two loops to cut the line. All right, just hang on a second. Here's what's happening. Lacan is telling us that there are three elements to a torus, two circuits, and then this third which also constitutes its own circuit. The first two circuits are these. I'm not a great artist, so bear with me. If you have a torus, you've got this tubular-like thing. It's three-dimensional, so it's what I'm trying to draw here. And it goes all the way around, right? It's a three-dimensional entity looking something like this. Here, it might be even easier to draw it out here. Here's your basic torus. You have to imagine this as a three-dimensional entity. What Lacan's saying is you have three circuits. There's the one here. There's circuit one. And you can draw it as many times as you want, as we've done here with these circles. In fact, the more times you draw it, the more obscure it gets. Isn't that Lacan's point right here at the top of page 21? Then there is this other circuit in every torus, which is around this, not the circumference of the donut, but around the tube itself. And you can draw as many of these around as you want. Again. You can repeat that as many times as you want, but each torus is gonna to have these two circuits. Lacan's point though, is that in order for the two to be buckled together the way they are in a torus, the little circles that go around the structure of the donut and the big circle that is the structure of the donut, in order for those two to be fastened together, there has to result this other third circuit which is the hole in between. This is the third circuit. One represented by the teal, two represented by the pink, and three represented by the hole in the middle, which corresponds here to A and E. If I am not making any drawing on the board today, which is partly why I got out the pen tab, because we don't have a drawing to accompany this, it is because in truth, in saying it, I am saying enough about it for you to understand me and also a good deal too little for me to show you that they are at least two paths at the origin along which this can be effected and that the result is not at all the same as regards the emergence of this additional one. Here we have it again, the additional one that I am in the process of speaking to you about. This simply suggestive indication contains nothing to exhaust the richness of what the least topological study provides you with. What we're getting at here is a one 
plus one that equals three. Teal plus pink doesn't just equal two circuits. There's a third absented circuit that props up the others. And that's why one plus one in, Lacan in Lacanian math is always going to equal three when it comes to the torus, because there's this third element in the middle, an element that is not included among the visible circuits being run around every torus. Page 21, continuing. What it is a matter simply of indicating today is that the specificity of this world of writing is precisely to distinguish itself from the discourse, from discourse by the fact that it can close. And closing on itself, it is precisely from there that there arises this possibility of a one, which has a completely different status to the one which unifies and encompasses. This is the additional one. It's a one that has a completely different status from the universe, the oneification that makes a set. There's something else here, an additional one. I think this is a profound point that Lacan is getting after here. Two cuts buckled together in such a way that a third emerges. What's at stake here? And if you've been with us on any of these other lecture series, this is going to be obvious is the structural logic of object little a. What does object a designate? Well, it's an opening. Yes, you've heard it from me before. Hence the science of psychoanalysis, <clears throat> objectality, a study of openings, and why little a is such a fundamental term in Lacan's algebra. It marks an opening. Little a, and again, you've heard it from me before, is the minimum irreducible distance, gap, lack, or opening between any two entities that allows them to remain distinct. If this gap, cut, line, distance, whatever you want to call it, if this opening were closed, you'd no longer see two entities. You would only see one. Now, in order for you to have an opening of any kind, however, you have to have an edge, a line, an edge, a rim, a limit, some kind of a stroke, if you will. Here's my question. What is the origin of this additional one that has an edge-like structure that is essential to and always escaping from, and thus uncountable within, every totalizing effort to count as one. Again, this is the question that Lacan gives us in the opening sections of seminar 14. What is the origin of this additional one that we've been talking about? We know it has an edge-like structure, we know that it is essential to, but always like a ferret, escaping from, and thus uncountable within, every totalizing effort to make a group of entities count as one, to totalize these entities. In Lacanian psychoanalysis, the name for this origin is the unary trait. And again, with an emphasis on the UN at the front of unary trait. The unary trait is a primordial signifier. It's the un of the father, which constitutes the split subject. And it's worth considering for a moment, considering that it is also what starts popping on page 22 of seminar 14. It's in italics. You can read it there yourself the unary stroke. And then another terrific example of all this with Daniel and the writing on the wall. We don't have time to get into it today, but it's definitely worth checking out. And if you want to see this playing out in more ways in Lacan, check out the third part of my book, The Chattering Mind, where in seminar two, you can see Lacan playing with this exact same passage in the book of Daniel. 
and in the chattering mind, I take it all apart. But for now, let's get after this unary trait because time is of the essence. What is the primordial signifier that is the origin of this additional one? Lacan is overwhelmingly clear here and throughout his work. The primordial signifier known as the unary trait is effectively the word no, N-O. But notice how this plays out in seminar 14. It starts on page 40. <clears throat> he introduces the no, which is foundational as regards the narcissistic structure on page 40. Then he moves into the negation of méconnaissance, of misrecognition. And then on page 41, he comes to this famous not without thinking. The way that we saw in seminar 10, anxiety is not without an object, which is not the same as saying it has one. It's like saying that its object is very special, unique, different. But this logic of the not without is popping on 41. We're not going to mess with it. We ain't got time. It comes down in the middle of 41 to be a matter of cause. And that's what we're after here. The unary trait that is the origin of this additional one, this one too many, that Lacan is drawing out of set theory is a cause. Lower half of page 41. Lacan finally just comes clean. What is meant by the term no? Non. What you have to remember in French also sounds exactly as the word for name, nom. N-O-N sounds exactly like N-O-M, which is why you get some interesting connections between the no of the father and the name of the father in Lacanian psychoanalysis. Can we even make it emerge as a form of complementary neither? This is his not without stuff, or I'm sorry, yeah. As a form of the may of may connaissance, nor in terms of the not without business. When it comes to be applied to the most radical terms around which I always made turn for you, the question of the fact of the unconscious. It's been a lot of work doing what we're doing here today. It comes down, though, to this. This no that brings us to the question of the fact of the unconscious. Namely, might the idea even come to us that when we speak about non-being, it is a matter of this something which is supposed to be in a way on the periphery of the, wait for it, bubble of being. Is non-being then all the space outside? Is it even possible to suggest that this is what we mean when we speak very confusedly in truth about this non-being that I would prefer on this occasion <laughs> to entitle by what is at stake and that the unconscious puts into question, namely the place where I am not. The un of the father, the non of the father is an incision, which looks a lot like this, by the way. That opens up a space, which looks a lot like this, by the way, where I am not. Where I exist as something which relative to the big other's claim to account for everything, can only be experienced as a no thing. 
a not thing, which is to say a something which is nothing. Now, there are two ways to move forward from here. One is to recall <clears throat> the example of going on a camping trip. <clears throat> You've heard it from me before. You get in the car. Maybe your partner, your friend, your homie picks you up right from your work. You jump in the car. You say, man, I can't wait to go camping. This is great. You take a sip of tea. You're getting after it. And you say, did you pack the tent? Fuck yeah, I packed the tent. Cooler full of beer. You know I got a cooler full of beer. You get that pillow. I got that pillow. You know that pillow I like? I like that pillow. You got to blow hair into it and it becomes a pillow. I like that pillow. You got that pillow. It's really small. You got it. Two ounces. Oh, yeah, I got your pillow. Bro, cool it. I packed everything. Everything is packed. This car contains everything we need for our camping trip. At which point you reach over and you grab the emergency brake and you pull it and you damn near cause an accident. And you say, stop the car, son. We got to turn around. We forgot something. What are you talking about? I just told you I packed everything. If you packed everything, then you left nothing behind. So turn around. We got to go get it. Nothing is excluded from every claim issued by a totalizing count. Nothing is necessarily excluded. In order to have a category of everything, the way that the big other purports early in life and the way that we sustain at the level of the fundamental fantasy, a something which is nothing relative to that claim to everything has to be excluded, has to be left out. In fact, it's so essential that if nothing weren't left out, the totalizing claim, like Russell's catalog of catalogs, would fail in its mission. It wouldn't work. Nothing has to be excluded in order for the claim to represent everything to hold. And that's what we're after here. Which brings us back to that superimposition of lack that we talked about around separation toward the end of seminar 11. Does this mean that my non-being, this place where I am not, is among those additional ones, those ones too many, which are essential to and excluded from the other. Which begs another more fundamental question. And this is the second way to turn out of this no thing, not thing, a something which is in fact nothing that is us. What exactly is the relation between the constitutive lack of the subject and the constitutive lack of the big other, of the symbolic. Is my non-being always already what the other is missing? Is the child always already dead to the parent? This is a question that is begged in that chapter on alienation in seminar 11. And it's a question that here Lacan puts us onto again by focusing on the way the un at the origin of the cause of desire, this un that corresponds to the additional one creates this space where I am not. It opens up a space where I am not. Is this the very space that the big other struggles to encompass, necessarily struggles to encompass? We'll see where Lacan goes with this. This puts us about 
40, 50 pages into seminar 14. The logic of fantasy is so far a lot of logic. In mentioning the fundamental fantasy, I've tried to put us on the trail that you can take from here. Whether that's where Lacan goes from here, we'll see. <laughs>